Okay, we are ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to today's virtual conference on Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department jails hosted by the Civilian Oversight Commission. My name is Danielle butler Vappi, and I'm the Interim Director of the Commission. Today, we're discussing efforts to reduce the likelihood that people end up cycling in and out of jail. This is the fourth and final session in a series of educational conferences about the Sheriff's Department jails. I wanna thank everyone for logging on today. We have a great panel of speakers lined up to discuss reducing recidivism. Today, you'll hear from Catherine Vacanti, who is the Director of Reentry Workforce and Education Programs for the newly formed LA County Justice Care and Opportunities Department, followed by the Department of Economic Opportunities Director, Kelly Lobianco, and from Dr. Jennifer Hunt, who is the Acting Senior Deputy Director of the Department of Mental Health's Reentry Services Division. Lastly, we'll hear from Los Angeles County Probation Director, Benuelos. Your moderator today will be our Commissioner Luis S. Garcia, who serves on the Commission's Conditions of Confinement Ad Hoc Committee. We invite your feedback about this series. You can respond to the survey at the end of the session, or you can email us at coconotify at coc.lacounty.gov. I'd also like to highlight that we have one vacant community appointee commissioner position. If you or someone you know would be interested and available to serve on the commission, please visit our website at coconotify.gov to review the bulletin and application. The deadline is June 30th. And now I'll turn it over to Commissioner Garcia. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And thank you again for joining us to learn about the efforts in the Los Angeles, in Los Angeles County to reduce recidivism. When someone is confined to jail, <coughs> excuse me, their life can forever change. Jobs can be lost, relationships severed, and homes are no longer the same. Despite efforts from county agencies, as we learned over the last three sessions, the atmosphere in jail is not always rehabilitative, and some transition out of the justice system can be hampered by many things that lead to recidivism. My name is Luis S. Garcia. If you participated in the first three sessions, you have a good understanding of my personal experiences with mental health and my time in county and state carceral environments. In the last session, I also shared some of my professional experiences working to assist others in the justice system. For those of you who I have not met, yet. I am a member of the Civilian Oversight Commission, and I work as a statewide behavioral health mental health consultant, helping public and private mental health and substance abuse providers to improve California's behavioral health system infrastructure. And I also volunteer as an associate clinical social worker, where I specialize in working with people to mild to moderate mental illness. When people transition from the confines of the cell to their community, Significant barriers exist, such as limited or no income, history of unemployment, being educationally disadvantaged, living with ser serious mental illness and or substance abuse disorder, or chronic health conditions, along with difficulty securing stable housing. These barriers can contribute to people cycling in and out of the Los Angeles County jail system. Recidivism can be can be described as the act of repeating an unde undesirable behavior despite having suffered negative consequences for that behavior. Generally, recidivism as a metric is defined as a new felony or misdemeanor conviction or probation violation within three years of the previous conviction. Countywide efforts to strengthen cross-sector collaboration to improve service delivery to justice system involved residents of LA County presents a transformative approach to helping people exiting the county jail achieve the st stability and support they need to stay out of jail and successfully reintegrate into their communities. As the commission continues to evaluate the jail conditions, we welcome continued community feedback. After the speakers provide their expertise, there will be an opportunity for the community to ask questions. In addition, written public comments regarding the jails can be submitted online. Please visit our website at coc.lacounty.gov for instructions. The deadline to submit written public comment is 5 p.m. tomorrow, June 13th. 
And now turning it over to today's speakers, although we've told you the names and titles of the panel speakers, I invite each of you to introduce yourself, including your preferred pronouns and a little bit about your background, if you wish. Without further ado, I will now turn it over to our first speaker, Catherine Bacanti, the Reentry Workforce and Education Programs Director at Los Angeles County Justice Care and Opportunities Department. Please go ahead, Catherine. All right, thank you, Commissioner Garcia. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Kate Bacanti. My preferred pronouns are she, her. And I have been with the county since December of 2018. I started in the reentry division um, when it when um, we were still within the Office of Diversion and Reentry uh, within the Department of Health Services. And um, I moved to JCOD this past November when our reentry division transferred to the new department. Uh, so and for anybody who's not familiar, JCOD, the Justice Care and Opportunities Department, was formed by the Board of Supervisors and launched last November with the purpose of centralizing LA County justice reform, pretrial services, reentry services, and jail closure work with an emphasis on the non-clinical components of this work. So today I'm gonna to talk about some of our reentry programs within JCOD and how we work to reduce recidivism. Some of these programs were covered on an earlier part of this um, conference series but, uh, by Vanessa Martin, who's the director of reentry at JCOD. And so I'm gonna talk about them a little bit more today. Um, next slide, please. So first I wanted to quickly provide some context for how reentry fits into JCOD's work overall. So this slide shows JCOD's approach to reducing involvement across all points in the justice system from prevention to diversion to reentry. Uh, JCOD's prevention initiatives address the systemic issues and structural inequities that often can be some of the root causes leading to crime and recidivism. This includes advancing the county's care first jail last vision by extend, expanding community-based programming through the Care First Community Investment Funds um, and reducing geographic and racial inequities in community investment. Then JCOD also has diversion programs uh, to minimize the harms of justice involvement by trying to keep people out at the point of um, arrest or court intercepts. And then finally, we have our program, programming and the reentry intercepts, which helps those who've already been impacted lessen the harms of justice involvement and reduce the likelihood that they return. So our reentry re programs serve a broad population uh, that includes people being released from jail or prison or on probation or parole. And we focus on people more with mild to moderate uh, mental health or substance use disorder needs. Next slide. So what can lead to recidivism after release? Uh, Commissioner Garcia, I think uh, already mentioned a lot of these, what these barriers are um, earlier um, when he was speaking, um, but from our point of view, um, kind of one of the main reasons people may end up returning is because they weren't able to connect to the resources and services that they needed to help them succeed in their transition. So their needs um, may go unaddressed. And this is what we aim to prevent through our reentry programming. Um, this is especially important during kind of the initial weeks and month of release when risk of recidivism is highest. Um, and so here I've listed some of the different factors that can contribute to or prevent recidivism. And um, these are the areas that we try to focus on. So the first are risk factors. These are uh, areas that research shows are most closely tied to risk of recidivism. Um, some of the common areas that we aim to address are things like uh, not being employed or in school or not having a strong work history, um, you know, attitudes or beliefs that could lead to harmful behaviors and challenges with substance use disorder. Uh, we also try to identify individual strengths and pre protective factors that can help prevent recidivism. These can be things like having strong family ties that we wanna make sure we're tapping into when working with people. And we also wanna make sure that we're connecting people to opportunities based on their strengths and interests. And then finally, um, we have, you know, just basic stabilization needs, making sure that people's basic needs are met so that they can uh, find some stability in the community. These are things like being able to find housing because it's really hard to focus on anything else if you don't have a safe place to live. It's also important to make sure people have connection to mental health support. You know, many people, um, you know, experience trauma just being incarcerated or may have experienced trauma earlier in their lives. Um, and on top of that coming out, they're gonna be facing a lot of collateral consequences, you know, having restrictions that limit their access to things like employment, licensing, housing opportunities. So it's just important to make sure that they have support, um, ways of coping and kind of building resiliency 
in face of these new challenges that they have to navigate. So next slide. So now I wanted to talk about four practices that we incorporate into our programs that are meant to reduce recidivism. These are both um, backed by research and informed by input from the communities we're serving. And these all kind of aim to address um, the things I mentioned on the last slide. So uh, the first is we use credible messengers or transformative mentoring in most of our programs. And uh, transformative mentoring is based on a core belief that communities have within them, the transformative resources to lift up justice involved people in a comprehensive and positive way. Uh, participants are matched with a case manager called a credible messenger who shares the experience of being involved in the justice system and can understand firsthand what they've gone through and the hardships they've faced. Um, this model has been shown to be effective, especially with youth and uh, emerging adults um, or transition age youth ages 18 to 24. Uh, credible messengers often work in partnership with probation and parole officers, and um, it's been shown that they can greatly increase engagement in services and programs. Uh, the next practice is uh, we focus a lot on sector based employment and training. Uh, employment is an important factor in determining success in the community because having a job, especially one that pays well, can provide the income you need to help you know, restart your life and be able to provide you for your family. It also provides a positive social network and um, important structure and stability that can help um, prevent people from ending back in the system. We focus on sector based training, which means trainings that give participants skills and credentials that are in demand by employers um, and industries that are growing. And these types of programs have shown to be effective in helping people gain employment and earn higher wages, uh, which can have a greater impact on reducing recidivism. Um, we also use cognitive behavioral interventions or therapy in, in many of our programs. Uh, CBI is a form of treatment that helps people examine their thought patterns and emotions that lead to unwanted behaviors um, that perhaps may have developed in response to a traumatic experience they had or you know, because of different influences they were exposed to and apply these strategies to alter those thoughts and emotions. Um, we use a few different cur curricula that focus heavily on cognitive behavioral skill building um, and allow participants to kind of practice the skills they're learning in a, um, in a group setting. Um, and this helps people kind of understand the thinking processes and um, learn problem solving skills so they can better manage challenging situations, whether that's in employment or interpersonal relationships in the future. Um, and finally, um, our, the last practice that we incorporate is collaboration with law enforcement, county partners, and CBOs. Collaboration is really critical to making sure that people don't fall through the cracks and return to the system. We partner with law enforcement and corrections to connect people to our services and to make sure that our staff and programs are working together to help people succeed. We also work really closely with county departments, um, including others who are on the call today and CBOs, because we know that we really need to work together to make sure we can get folks connected to the range of different services they need, whether that's mental health, substance use, housing, or access to employment or educational opportunities. Next slide. So next, I wanna highlight a few of our programs and how they incorporate um, the practices I just covered. So our first um, program is called Reentry Intensive Case Management Services. This is a credible messenger program that provides care coordination and service navigation to people with justice involvement through community health workers or CHWs with shared lived experience. Because many people lack positive support networks to return to, CHWs can make a big difference in helping them overcome challenges and staying on track to achieve their goals. Um, they have, they know they'll have somebody, with, somebody to go to who'll be looking out for them and advocating for them. Our CHWs take a whatever it takes approach to help their clients, whether it's accompanying them to a doctor's appointment um, or helping them find jobs or housing. Our ICMS is our largest program currently operated by 23 CBOs with a capacity to serve over 2,500 clients at any time. And it often serves as a conduit into some of our other programs. One of its main referral sources is the county jails um, care transition unit pre-release program, which helps us make sure that we're um, reaching people just as they're being released. And then we also take referrals from probation, parole, city jails, and from the community. Next slide. Um, these two programs are also credible messenger programs um, with, uh, you know, community health workers who provide intensive case management, similar to RICMS, but they're tailored to serve more specific populations. 
So um, the YO program is Youth Overcoming, and this is a program designed to work with transition age youth, age 18 to 24. And then we also have the POWER program, which is providing opportunities for women reentry. Um, and this is a gender responsive program for women. Uh, both of these programs were de developed in partnership with the probation department. Um, so YO, Yo has um, credible messenger mentors with lived experience who offer support and advice. They focus their case management on education and employment. And then YO also has um, a group session, uh, group sessions that are, have a curriculum based on cognitive behavioral principles. And then POWER um, connects uh, women to safe housing, employment, family, reuni family reunifications, um, support groups, and mental health. And this program also includes a um, group therapy curriculum called Beyond Trauma that also uses cognitive behavioral techniques. Next slide. Um, and then the sector program is our employment program that offers skills training and paid work experience in high growth sectors that offer career pathway opportunities and family sustaining wages. Um, we launched the program in 2021 and we have six providers that serve about 600 people annually. Um, we offer the program in nine different sectors within LA County that are growing. Some of those include construction, green jobs, healthcare, and social assistance, um, and government. And the picture here is, is a group of participants going through a solar panel installation training um, with Paving the Way in Lancaster, an organization up there. Um, our providers partner with community colleges, pre-apprenticeship programs, um, America's Job Centers of California, and other training providers to connect people to these uh, training opportunities. The sector program also incorporates credible messengers through career coaches and peer support specialists with lived experience um, who support job uh, who support participants with job readiness. Um, and then finally, the program also has a cognitive behavioral intervention group session, which helps participants build um, problem solving skills for for the workplace. And next slide, which is my last slide. Um, I wanted to highlight our DOORS program, which is um, developing opportunities and offering reentry solutions. Um, and the DOORS reentry opportunity, or sorry, the DOORS Community Reentry Center is located um, in Probation's Reentry Opportunity Center. Um, so this is a great example of um, a program that's a collaboration across county partners. Um, the DOORS is meant to be um, kind of a welcoming environment, a one-stop shop where somebody can access all the services that they need um, to help them be successful with reentry. So um, services that are located there include housing, employment, legal aid, educational support, mental health assessment, and linkage, substance use counseling, counseling health and healing through the arts. Um, and we have uh, service providers through um, who provide services on site as well as different county departments who are located there. And that includes the Department of Mental Health, um, Economic Opportunity, in the Department of Public Social Services. Um, so that's my final slide, and I'm happy to answer questions later about any, or, any of our programs. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> Next, we'll hear from the Department of Economic Opportunities Director, Kelly Lobianco. Please take it away, Kelly. Thank you. Um, Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the Civilian Oversight Commission for having me today um, and uh, Commissioner Garcia and, and Kate's presentation um, is a good jumping off point for what I'm going to talk about as well um, with the Department of Economic Opportunity. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide, please. All right, so um, I know Commissioner Garcia said to present a little bit about ourselves and our department. Um, so my name is Kelly Lobianco. I'm the director of LA County's new Department of Economic Opportunity. We're about to reach our first anniversary in, of existence. The Board of Supervisors um, came together during the pandemic um, to try to centralize workforce development um, program services, policies, and activities throughout the county, and also link workforce development to economic development. So when we're talking about service to businesses and we're talking about services to workers, um, we really connect the dots there. So we're helping folks um, not only connect to a job, but connect to a job that exists today and is growing in the future. Um, so we're very excited to be a brand new department. We pulled together teams from the former Workforce Development, Aging and Community Services Department, Department of Consumer and Business Affairs, 
the Los Angeles County Development Authority and CEO's Economic Development Division. So if you don't know us, um, don't worry, we're still new, um, but that, that's who we are. Um, we um, at the Department of Economic Opportunity are not just about you know, connecting someone to a job or making sure there's unbridled growth here in LA County. We really are thinking about all of our work with an equity lens. Um, so I did want to raise up our mission and vision uh, before we dig into our conversation about recidivism and how employment um, and entrepreneurship connect there as supports. So our vision is an equitable economy with thriving local communities, inclusive and sustainable growth and opportunity and mobility for all. Um, for some reason, we're losing some L's in here, but know that where there's two, it only shows one. Um, so mission, um, DEO creates quality jobs, helps small businesses and high road employers start and grow and builds vibrant local communities and spaces. Um, so when you think about our department, like I said, it's businesses and workers. Uh, we're supporting those who need our services the most. So you can imagine we're working with small businesses, um, committed uh, industries uh, for quality jobs, and we're working with um, workers that may need uh, the support of our department. So that very much includes individuals who are system impacted. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, a few things you can expect from the Department of Economic Opportunity, uh, and we like to sort of lift it up as our, our value and benefit of partnering with us. Um, it's important to note that we're a small but mighty department. We're about 200 um, in the county. That's a, that's a small department, um, but we do most of our service delivery with community-based organizations, with community colleges, with other workforce development boards, with fellow departments, with employers and industry councils themselves, with our labor partners. Um, so it's a very uh, collaborative process to deliver uh, workforce and economic development services. Um, so we, um, as I mentioned, we have a large community. We partner um, extensively. We focus on equity and advancement. Um, so you'll see um, here, we're gonna be talking about some of our uh, programs and services focused on system impacted individuals who are reentering, um, but we're also focused on individuals with lived homelessness experience, those who uh, are transition age youth, um, individuals that have been historically disinvested um, and are under and unemployed. Um, we bring together funding from local, state, federal, philanthropic areas uh, to make sure we can do this work at scale. Uh, we know we're in a region with 10 million, um, uh, 10 million residents, uh, a quarter of a million small businesses, a million when you count small um, individual proprietorships, um, and four to five million workers. So um, we're really we know we have to do this work in partnership to make sure that we really meet the need. Um, we do this work through 19 American Job Centers of California. You heard Kate. Uh, mentioned that those partners, we have sites all across LA County and we work with our fellow workforce development boards. Um, and we also have an East LA Entrepreneur Center that's in Central Marvia. Um, and as you heard um, from my, um, my colleagues, we do things with a evidence-based approach. We wanna make sure that we're investing in strategies and programs and services and policy that really work and get folks good and good jobs and put folks along career pathways and help new entrepreneurs start up and grow. And so we're investing in uh, in programs that we know that have those outcomes. Next slide, please. All right, so what are we doing in terms of supporting um, justice impacted individuals that are part of our economic and workforce development system? Uh, we have a lot of programs and I'll get to some of them shortly, but um, I wanted to take a step back and um, talk about some of the ways that we support. Um, individuals um, and also support businesses in their hiring. Um, so part of what we're doing is um, extensive outreach and engagement. We do this directly as a department and we also do this through community-based organizations and in partnership with fellow departments. Um, we offer career case management. Um, so essentially, sorry, some of the some of the spacing on this got messed up, but I'll talk us through it. So the career case management, essentially we're talking to folks about uh, career exploration, um, what opportunities are available. We help do assessments. Um, we help build folks candidacy for work. So making sure folks have their documents together, that we're building sort of the life skills um, needed to be competitive, a competitive candidate for any job. Um, we do very specific work readiness preparation. 
um, making sure folks know how to talk about their experience in the justice system. Um, we know that there's opportunity costs to um, participating in um, even a day's worth of, of services or many weeks, depending on the program. And so we offer stipends and cash assistance. Um, we're connecting folks to pre-apprenticeships um, and other industry recognized training. Um, we're connecting folks to mentorship, supportive services, paid work experiences. Um, and we're working directly with businesses um, to make sure that they are engaging in fair chance hiring, um, but also um, see that the individuals work at, working with are a talent pool for hire that bring the um, life skills and experiences that they need uh, to for their own bottom line. Um, and again, we also work closely with our partners at probation and sheriff's department, as well as many other departments that are here on this call, including JCOD, mental health and others. Next slide, please. All right, so this is just a snapshot of the year. Um, I will say one one thing is like, uh, as I talked about earlier, it's it's by mission and mandate that we're supporting justice impacted individuals. You heard from my, my, my colleagues um, why employment investments and in, in entrepreneurship sort of falls under that um, are so important as both a prevention tactic as well as um, uh, supporting folks who are reentering um, employment, uh, health and safe, like basically economic health and safety, um, security and mobility are inextricably linked to success along all other dimensions. And so, you know, we are really making sure that we're providing enough and holistic um, and informed uh, programs and services to individuals who have been just as impacted because we know that that will have um, a multiplier effect on economic opportunity and mobility for all LA County residents. Um, so we're investing, um, you know, we invest nearly $100 million in workforce development services every year and growing. Um, and 21 million of that is in this coming year directly um, invested for just impacted individuals. So I won't sort of belabor this too much, but these are there's a variety of funding streams that that make that up. But what I really want to underscore is this is our, our commitment of our department to supporting um, individuals that need our support and connecting to work. Next slide, please. All right, and so a little bit of uh, programming and impact. So we run a bunch of different programs and they have a slightly different look and feel um, and, uh, and purpose, um, but we're supporting over 7,000 justice system impacted individuals um, in recent years. Um, in the, um, that includes through pro programs focused uh, with um, our probation department and on individuals who are on probation, including our invest program, prison to employment program, a state funded program and renew, which we're funding with care for uh, with AB 109 and some care, care first community investment. Um, these programs bring together uh, our American Job Centers of California, probation offers, making sure there's a seamless transition uh, between our departments um, who are serving individuals who are just as impacted, but also looking to connect to work. Um, that sort of co-location, co-integration has been very successful for us, serving you know, between 800 and 1,000 individuals for a year since launch a few years ago. Um, we also run a program with the city of LA called LA Rise, as well as um, dozens and dozens of social enterprises uh, where we support individuals who have lived homelessness experience, who have justice um, system experience in connecting to uh, transitional work across sectors and then connection to unsubsidized employment. Um, again, serving thousands of individuals through these programs um, and we were able to fund that through Measure H. We have a couple of occupation specific programs, um, such as Careers for a Cause, where we are um, working with individuals who have lived experience um, and connecting them to training with our community colleges uh, for careers in homeless services and social services, especially as we're investing more and more in this area um, to combat our humanitarian crisis here in LA County. Um, and so this is a really a program that helps build a more empathetic workforce and fill a really vital social services need. Um, we have Youth at Work. It's a program that serves about 10,000 uh, young adults every single year with transitional work experience and personal enrichment. 
um, and we're doing, um, we fund uh, individuals who are just as impacted directly through this program and have uh, dedicated funds for that. Um, so those are some of our transition youth. youth. Um, we also run the Fair Chance Hiring Program. So this is um, uh, both direct services to individuals and businesses looking to hire, but also a campaign that informs folks of the law um, and makes sure that folks are adhering to the law um, and talks about some of the advantages in hiring uh, folks that do have lived experience. Um, and that's running right now. We're funding that through the American Rescue Plan, um, serving about a thousand individuals um, in this particular campaign. And lastly, we partner with the Sheriff's Department and a variety of community-based organizations at the Century Regional Detention Facility, offering um, job preparation and sector-based training uh, prior to folks' release. And so, you know, we're really excited about the diversity of programs that we're able to offer in partnership with CBOs and community colleges and our fellow departments. Um, you can see the numbers are impressive, but don't nearly scratch the surface of the need in LA County. And so we look forward to continuing to um, build on these programs in the future years of the department. Um, and also, I'll just shout out that we do are very interested uh, in the context of this conversation, you know, what more we can be doing as a department. Next slide, please. Um, this is just briefly to show that, again, we do this in partnership. We work with many community-based organizations. If you're a community-based organization on this call, a nonprofit, we also encourage you to connect with us at DEO around our social enterprise master agreement. Um, so we, put, we help um, nonprofits who are interested in contracting with accounting to deliver services like these. Um, uh, we connect them to this master agreement list, and it's a it's a way to um, expedite some of our contracting, which we know can be a hurdle, um, and we try to reduce that because it's important for us to deliver this in partnership. Next slide, please. And lastly, before I pass it over to my colleagues, um, this is just ways to get in touch with us. So uh, for folks who are looking to connect to the American Job Centers of California or the East LA Entrepreneur Center, that's how you find out about all of the programs that I just mentioned. There's a QR code. There's ways in this little purple box to follow us. We also push out information on our socials and our newsletters. Um, and then here you can see a couple of specific links to our programs, including careers for a cause and fair chance hiring. Um, and with that, I will pass it back to Commissioner Garcia and look forward to answering any questions uh, when the time comes. Thank you, Kelly, for that presentation. <clears throat> now you'll. We hear from Jennifer Hunt, who is the acting senior deputy director of the Department of Mental Health Reentry Services Division. Please take it away, Jennifer. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner. My name is Jennifer Hunt. Good morning. I'm the acting senior deputy director for the reentry services, as was stated here with the Department of Mental Health. And um, DMH has been fortunate to be a participant in a few of these sections of this series. So. I just wanted to highlight today what some of the services in the reentry elements of our programs are here to support individuals as they leave custody, as well as hopefully to ensure that we provide supports and resources to reduce the chances of future contacts with the justice system. Next slide. So just kind of wanted to be a little bit global and kind of take a little higher view and, and talk briefly about how Cal AIM and some of those changes are going to be allowing us to kind of expand our services and really coordinate well in the reentry space. And this is across all of our county partners that we want to focus on the linkages and connections to services in the community. Specifically for our unit here at DMH, I would like to talk about the forensic mental health court programs and our community engagement programs and a reference to full service partnership as well. Next slide. So we have two kind of large components of supports and resources in the reentry division under the court umbrella. So we have our rapid diversion program, which is a partnership with our partners at JPOD as well as the public defender's office related to misdemeanor and felony cases. And we work and conduct evaluations and we link individuals to services 
when they are deemed competent to stand trial and they are appropriate for mental health diversion. RDP has been funded through the MacArthur Foundation for a large amount of its operations. And so this has been a program that has received a lot of attention and has a lot of success with its coordinated care and resources that we can provide individuals when they are in the court system. The second part of that is the court liaison program, which is where we have our DMH um, clinicians and other team members that are outreaching individuals at the courthouses that are helping them with mental health and substance use needs. We also support diversion here as well and look at alternative sentencing and post release plans. And we also have members that are in the Hollywood courthouse, the mental health courthouse, looking at and providing services to those found incompetent to stand trial for misdemeanors as well. The court linkage and liaison program has been, it had a smaller footprint, unfortunately, during COVID, but we've been working really hard to make sure that we are getting fully staffed and continuing to meet the needs of all of the courthouses at this time. Next slide. So those are the court components, and now we also have the community components. So we have a few of our programs that actually begin to reach into the jails and do outreach while individuals are still incarcerated. And those would be our men's and women's community reintegration programs. I know the county likes its acronyms, so I will try not to jumble them all up and use their full names. But the um, men's and women's programs they're both gender specific programs working with the specific needs of individuals as they are leaving the jails. And this is one of our focus points so that we can help reduce the chances of recidivism within the first year of release. These services would include our mental health services, services related to substance use disorders, linkages to primary treatment and case management services. And cases in these programs can stay open for up to two years. The other program that I would like to mention is our assisted outpatient treatment program. We refer to it as AOT. So maybe as I said, county acronyms, we love using them, right? But assisted outpatient treatment is also known by some as Laura's Law. And this is focusing on individuals with severe mental illness at substantial risk of deterioration because of their psychiatric treatment and their lack of participating in treatment in the past and that they would have difficulty surviving safely in the community. The eligibility has a list, but just for our purposes here, it's for individuals that have had two incarcerations within the past three years. And this also includes the individuals I referenced before that may have been found incompetent to stand trial for a misdemeanor offense. Both of these, pro both all three of these programs really focus on reaching in and working with our partners in correct, correction health services at DHS, which my colleagues have already mentioned on this panel um, through the care transitions program. And so it's our role and goal to be able to engage individuals in treatment so that when they're leaving, they're already connected. There's not an issue of, well, who do I go to and where is my next step? Because we've already made that connection ideally before they have left. Next slide. So now this is something that's really important that I just wanted to take the time to emphasize here is that Cal AIM, we, you may hear that in other settings related to funding. These are the changes that will go into effect for Medi-Cal here in California, effective July 1st. So in less than three weeks, this massive change to the Medi-Cal program and system as we know it is happening. And for the reentry, for the programs in reentry, as well as those individuals who are reentering and leaving um, incarceration, this is significant because it'll provide equitable and coordinated person-centered approaches to care. So this is where terms like a warm handoff and the transition services you'll hear things like that come up because those are actually written in and part of the legislation now, talking about the importance of making sure that individuals have their Medi-Cal before they leave. Oftentimes when they're in a correctional setting, it's frozen or some people may say that it's um, 
frozen or it's inactive. So it's basically Cal Lame and the reentry initiatives are looking to make sure that that Medi-Cal is back in an active status so that individuals can get their services. And so that's what the reference is related to not act, being active in 90 days. And this is not only for adults, but for youth. So this is significant for our youth that are leaving, for example, any of the probation settings. And I know I'm I'm preceding the director in his uh, his talk points next. So we work in partnership because as we do provide mental health services for youth in the halls and the camps, um, we've made conscious efforts to make sure that we have these programs and and are assisting the youth in their transitions to receiving services when they uh, are leaving probation settings. So this is a key thing. The important parts to highlight is that all of the services in the reentry division through DMH all focus on the continuity of care, making sure that we have services for our clients when they are moving into the community. We wanna make sure that there's housing supports, the social supports, and the research linkages. Employment is huge, as my fellow panelists have already talked about, the fair chance hirings, different things, employment programs and expanding sectors, that's significant because we know that these are all collectively the greatest protective factors from having individuals have future justice contact. The other thing to highlight is there's also the Public Defender's Office has been working on um, kind of hand in hand with the Fair Chance Act to have um, expungement clinics. And so that's something that in addition to the collaborative courts and some of the different um, programs that the Public Defender's Office have supported greatly in many different ways, whether it's through JCOD, DMH, or a combination of different county partnerships, the expungement clinics and the possibility of having some of those things addressed to en enhance and make the chances of employment that much more successful in the future um, are very, very positive things that have been happening. And we're proud to be part of that. And I believe that is my final slide. That it is. And so I hand it back over to the commissioner. Thank you again, Jennifer, for that, pre that excellent presentation. Now we'll hear from Los Angeles County Probation Director uh, Ben Wellos. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you, Commission, for having me. Um, unfortunately, Interim Chief uh, Vr Rosa wasn't able to make it, so hoping to fill some very large shoes and kind of highlight some of the programs that probation has to offer on the juvenile and the adult side, and then go into a little bit of the efforts that, that we're doing daily in order to address um, such a serious problem as recidivism or, or focus on divergence or to not have people enter our systems. But I, I really want to just highlight before I get into the programs, how you've heard over and over again, the collaboration between departments. And so I think that's really encouraging as a county to see so many departments come across lines and work collaboratively, like in the programs of stores and, uh, and, and so many others that were spoke of in the juvenile halls with our partners at uh, DMH and so forth. But in, in regards to our juvenile diversion programs, we have uh, two that I'll just briefly highlight. Uh, one is called Teen Court. It offers uh, alternative in the form of diversion program to first-time youthful offenders in lieu of delinquency court proceedings. So Teen Court basically over, is overseen by the Superior Court it consists of a volunteer judicial officer, a court coordinator, a deputy probation officer, a jury composed of at least six peers of that young person. Uh, probation collaborates with the court, other law enforcement agencies, schools, attorneys, and community-based organization in this particular program. And then also we have the early intervention and diversion program. Uh, this is a first time youthful offenders on non-court informal probation court ordered informal probation and home on probation. Uh, this program design includes a deputy probation officer working through a collaborative partnership with the Department of Mental Health, contracted CBOs or community-based organizations, and to provide services to the first time offenders and their families. This program has been identified as a promising program to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and the National Institute of Justice. On the adult side, uh, there's two, two programs I'd like to highlight. One is the Mental Health Court Diversion Program. Uh, 
is approximately 300 mental health diversion cases currently that are being supervised through this program. Um, for some brief history, in 2016, the department developed a mental health housing court caseload, which is primarily goals to supervise um, the Office of Diversion and Reentry Court Order grants of probation. Uh, mental health housing court program is a supervision program for adults mentally and homeless, or I'm sorry, mentally ill and homeless clients who receive housing and mental health treatment upon release from county jail. The mental health housing court program is an innovative intensive supervision program that requires a deputy probation officer to su supervise their clients in the community. And then uh, I'd like to really highlight the FIST program or felony incompetent to stand trial. It's approximately 370 cases currently under the supervision caseload. And this is the first program, the FIST program, which involves collaborative uh, with the Department of Mental Health Services, the Office of Diversion, Department of Mental Health, the California Superior Court. Unlike uh, other programs that primarily service clients on formal grants of probation, persons in this program are not on probation and will have had their criminal case placed on hold for up to two years while working collaboratively um, with their care team, what we call the care team, to obtain uh, permanent housing and address their other needs. So there's some of the programs there, but uh, my experience working for Los Angeles County Probation Department over 20 years has been both on the adult and juvenile side. And uh, just as mentioned before, when it comes to our, our young people currently in our juvenile halls or camps, we have implemented several um, efforts uh, to bring in the LA model as a program element to that to their experience there. And part of the elements of the LA model is bringing a curriculum that's cognitive based to address some of their skill deficiencies and better preparing them as they enter the community. That model is also served on the adult side. That supervision is called core supervision, which is our our core supervision model for adults. It also includes a curriculum uh, that tries to address those cognitive distortions and, and basically build up some life skills that maybe they have not picked up along the way that helps them deal with those day-to-day -day life decisions. So in whole, that's, that's uh, some of the efforts probation has going on uh, currently. And uh, as I mentioned before, so many more that are collaborative with our partners. So that's what I have for you guys today. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ben Willis. I'd like to thank all the speakers here today, this morning, for providing the information on the county's efforts to reduce recidivism. As we all have seen, even with, all, with the well-intentioned programs offered by the county, there are still gaps that allow people to fall through the cracks into recidivism. However, today's presentations provided an excellent overview of the county's efforts to closing those gaps. Our conversations here today are important and we hope to build partnerships that improve the system to actually support people from a person-centered lens. Before we jump into questions from the public, I'd like to ask the panelists a few questions. And my first question, I, uh, I'll direct it to Kelly. Um, so, I was impressed with the overall efforts of you know what this new department is doing, and I couldn't help but reflecting on my own uh, reentry journey and through higher education. And uh, as a graduate student, when I was at USC in an MS in the MSW program, I looked back on that time, and I was so fortunate because. My first year internship was at a county department. It was Department of Health Services. I was placed at Rancho Los Amigos. Uh, I was in the neurology unit and I worked, or I was an intern, and I had my, my field instructor, social work, clinical social worker, and you know I was part of the, the treatment team as an intern two days a week. Um, I was I got out of prison on on 925.97, so this was like 2001. And fast forward to my second year internship, where I was at La, Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, and I was in the um, administra administration building, emergency outreach bureau. I did a life scan for the county, and you know here I was placed at at um, 
GMH. And this was over, yeah, like 18, 20 years ago. And we, there was apps, services, there was a dearth of, dearth of services back then. Um, and so I'm impressed to hear and see what your department is doing. And my question is, is there like a branch or is there any like um, opportunities to, with partnering? Because in my work, I see a lot of people that have been impacted um, going back to school and they're in graduate programs, um, MSW programs specifically, and they have this background, um, yet there are still, you know, a lot of barriers that can come up. Maybe there's some of it's perceived, you know, and, and some of it is, I think, some of the structural things that are that are present, you know, makes it kind of like you feel like you're in the shadows still. And and having been in those two different intern experiences, I know what that feels like. Because I but I also see this opportunity now for these, you know, this department or maybe even some of the other departments partnering with some of these graduate schools that have individuals that have those backgrounds that are looking and seeking to enter into a professional workforce. Has that been anything that this department has been looking at or? Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, I will say, so we do partner with a lot of different organizations to, to essentially like outreach and engage and direct folks to the services of our department in the county. Um, I would have to get back to you on how well we've done actually with our graduate school programs, to be honest. Um, but one of the things, um, like, like two, two points from you, what you made, I think there's always more work we can do to make sure that people are exposed to the opportunities that we have in the county. I think we all are subject to that um, terrible uh, rumor that we're like the best kept secrets out there. Like we, the government typically doesn't do the best job of marketing um, all the programs and services and opportunities that we have in a coordinated way. So that folks feel like they can navigate and access everything they need it when they need it at the level they need it at the moment they need it. Um, so I, I think that there's the, these opportunities for us to come together like this are important to to share and for folks to see the breadth of opportunities. So um, I think there's that, and then I think too um, the pathway to county government. I, I'm appreciative that you bring that up too because one, I think the county. We can still go further on our own fair chance hiring. I know there's a lot of efforts from our Department of Human Resources and individual departments to break down the own, our own systemic barriers to hiring individuals who've come in contact with the justice system. Um, but these are really good jobs when you get them. Um, and so we we are actually um, we have a program called the Place Program, which I didn't mention in this context, called Preparing Los Angeles for County Employment. Um, and we work closely with DHR on a lot of their, what we call sort of county pipeline programs, but make, essentially making sure that folks know how they can connect to the county, um, preparing folks uh, so that they can get on specialty lists, um, and then making sure that the, the we're both expediting and making and streamlining the process to get a county job. And I think there's more that we can do sort of in this space too, helping folks who are reentering um, access some of those pathways to county jobs. Um, and then again, continuing to like break down our own barriers for hiring in that way. Um, but I'd love to talk to you more, Commissioner Garcia, about some of your ideas and even some of the programs that we should be connecting to. Thank you. Look forward to that. Uh, and my, okay, so my next second question, which is going to build off my first question to Ms. Bianco, would be directed to uh, Kate. And um, with JCOD and, and, and the overview of the, the, the presentations that are being done, or the, I mean, the organizations that are, are working with JCOD, is there in within JCOD a, a partnership for university partnership opportunity there as well? Yes, so we actually um, right now have a small program that's called College and Career. And this is a program in partnership with community colleges, which has, I think, a similar to goal with what you were getting at was, you know, helping um, people impacted by the justice system have a pathway towards pursuing a degree. Um, so right now we um, we partner with three community colleges, and they um, they provide, you know, it's 
it's a way to help, you know, folks that are just as impacted that are going through community college kind of develop a network of others who may be going through the same thing and, you know, getting that additional support and case management to help them stay in college and, you know, pers persist from semester to semester. Um, so, you know, right now that's, you know, the, the goals of that program are, you know, to help people either um, achieve a vocational certificate or get an AA degree or transfer to a four-year college. Um, so, you know, I think, and it's a small program, I, I see a lot of opportunity to expand and think about other colleges um, and more advanced degrees, you know, that we can help people connect to because we know, you know, education is so important, you know, such an important aspect of recidivism and helping people um, you know, get connected to educational resources that they may have not had an opportunity to access um, prior. So, yes, I agree with with both you and Kelly. It would be great to talk more about opportunities there to work with more schools. Yes, uh, and, and especially, you know, with I, I I'm familiar with the credible messenger um, uh, opportunities, and I've seen their work in the community and with I know when I I've gone to speak to some graduate programs and you know I have there's been students that will come up after the you know after my presentation and kind of like hey I was in county jail you know and how did the hell did how the heck did you do it this is I've, I've just recently heard that and you know the workforce with the need for for um people with lived experience you know it's not too frequently which this is going to lead to my next question to to Ms. Hunt, Dr. Hunt. But with but but then JCOT, I think that you know this area is right now with you know workforce shortages and and um, you know there's a robust group of you know different universities with you know individuals that are graduating with MS you know MSWs and specifically that I know that you know it's a it's a it's a workforce that's you know hungry to work in in government settings and having been a public employee for seven years that was fortunate to have calpers you know it it, it does contribute to you know rebuild you know building into the mainstream and and you know transforming your life so with with that um thank you for your your comments so dr hunt um along that same lines you know with dmh I know there's there's um, also you know a workforce shortage and in the same lens you know I, I recently went to go speak to a forensic mental health uh, forensic MSW class at Cal State LA and you know the same same uh, kind of environment of you know these future MSWs looking to to you know get into the workforce uh, and within now. DMH's, you know, role in this and their reentry programs, you know, 20 years ago, I remember when there was virtually nothing. And so it's really exciting and, and you know, I'm hopeful to see, you know, the work that's being done by DMH now. And having professionals with lived experience, I think, brings a, a, another added value to, to the work. And as do you, are you aware of anything within DMH's look that's you know, with partnering with universities as well, and absolutely. So, with our reentry programs as a whole, and the county has been, we've been working with big counties HR related to items related to recruitment efforts and having those collaborations and partnerships. So, our teams have actually been speaking at multiple LA City colleges, community colleges specifically ELAC for their substance abuse counselor program certification and um, the men's and women's re reintegration programs have been speaking at different colleges, whether it's Cal State LA, CSUN or other Cal State universities to the graduating classes for master's programs in various things. I spoke at UCLA a few weeks ago talking about care court and um, seeing if some of the MSW public policy students would be interested in that. Um, so that's one piece is the recruitment. Second is programming. So we've been working on having our items related to our justice programs have and consider formally lived experience as part of that matrix for the employment. And so HR has been working with us on those on those elements. We've also been focusing on the um, 
in addition to the recruitment and retention, we also have, and it's not the focus of today, but just to put it out there, because it is again under the reentry umbrella, is the upcoming care court program that the governor and has had a lot of traction and conversation about. And so specifically for care, we were working on and have been working with community stakeholder groups related to really getting individuals with lived experience to be part of the team and be employees at DMH to be able to engage individuals in treatment that have not historically been coming to our clinics or have been asking for mental health services directly. And so we feel that the lived experience is critical to have as part of that team of people that go out to engage the individual and try to um, support them in understanding what mental health services, as well as supports in all different areas, can bring to their life to enhance their quality of life. So I think we've got a few different things going on, not only at the program level, but at the department level and then at the larger county level to bridge over and cross over with a lot of our county partners. So it's a very exciting time. And I think that um, we have, there's a lot of momentum behind these things as well as the expungement and really looking at what is going to allow people the truest eco economic opportunities to access well-paying jobs. Yes, and thank you for that. Um, you know, and within this um, area, with, well, specifically for individuals that had, you know, past lived experiences that are, you know, entering the workforce with a graduate degree and are thinking of clinical, uh, a clinical track, you know, there has been recent um, legislation that has opened the door, which it did for myself, to um, not have to compile everything in your background in order to to submit to the to the state board of behavioral sciences if you have a certain class of uh, um, a certain time frame and a certain class you know if you're considered the, the good convictions or don't have a non-violent conviction history so there's a lot of education in that realm you know for individuals that may have just spent time in the county jail but then they think they cannot become licensed but there has been you know reforms at the state level that opens the door and with, you know, with the advent of care court and having, I think, you know, having individuals with lived experience that, you know, can meet clients where they're at with their own personal lived and professional experiences, I think is a win-win for, you know, the, the, any county department that's working and serving, you know, residents. So thank you for the efforts. Again, it's, it's just exciting to hear what, what is being done now at the county level. And my last question, it'll, it'll be directed uh, back to Kate. And I asked this on our last, on the, on the previous call, but I wanted to kind of circle back on it with, you know, the family um, involvement in the reentry process. You know, a lot of individuals will come out of the jail and, and you know, or a treatment center and, and return back home to, 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 uh, their family and um, their community. Can you talk a little bit about the efforts with JCOD around this area? Providing support? Sure, yeah. I think um, all of our programs really encourage families to get involved in supporting someone um, who may be returning to the community. I think it's, you know, having the support of family members who are, you know, actively looking out for you and advocating for you can make, just can make a huge difference in somebody being successful. So I think all of our um, community-based organizations, you know, make an effort to, you know, when they're working with somebody, also engage family members in their case management um, and make sure that they have supports to help them with whatever, whatever it might be, whether it's finding a job or, um, you know, continuing to receive treatment and in mental health services. So, you know, I would just say, you know, my recommendation would be uh, to make sure that your family members are involved in, and active with the organization that maybe you might be connected to, whether that's through RACMS or sector or one of our other programs. Um, you know, I think that, you know, again, making sure that you have somebody looking out for you um, that can just make a huge difference in, in somebody being able to stay on track. Um, if there are questions, if family members have questions about how to get involved, um, you know, anyone is welcome to reach out to me and I can help make sure you get to connected to our different programs. 
And of course, um, the doors is another place where, you know, families are really encouraged to show up and be involved. Um, it's a, you know, supposed to be a welcoming environment, you know, that's not just for folks on probation to come to, but anybody in the community who needs help. Um, so that's another way, um, you know, kind of like a brick and mortar way that we really try to make sure that families feel engaged and involved and can get the help that they need for their, for their loved ones. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for everyone for this morning's your presentations were excellent and I'm encouraged to see where the county is heading. With that, and now I, we'd like to open this up to the live uh, Q&A portion. And Jennifer, are there any questions for the panel? Yes, we do have a couple of folks uh, lined up to ask questions. We'll begin with Ashley Guzman, but before we do that, just as a reminder, if you are logged into WebEx to ask a question, please raise your hand. If you have called in, please press star three to get in queue to be unmuted. I will unmute you when it's your turn so that you can ask your question. If your question is for a specific panelist, please feel free to state that. To ask a question, you must be logged into the WebEx or phoned into the meeting. If you are commenting on the Facebook Live video, your question may be read out loud by the host. And then before we begin, we do have a quick announcement in Spanish. So Eric, please go ahead. Hola y buen día. Si ha iniciado la conferencia por WebEx y gustaría hacer una pregunta, por favor toque la imagen de la mano y alguien le ayudará. Si está escuchando la conferencia por teléfono y quiere hacer una pregunta, por favor presione estrella 3 y alguien le ayudará cuando sea su turno. Si su pregunta es para un panelista específico, por favor indique eso al comienzo de su pregunta. Por fin, si, ha, si está viendo la conferencia en vivo por Facebook y ha hecho un comentario, la anfitriona va a leer su comentario al grupo. Gracias. Thank you, Eric. And just as a reminder, this is not public comment. It is a Q&A session. So there won't be any timing for any of the attendees asking your questions. But with that, we'll go ahead and begin. Ashley, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Ashley Guzman. I work for a nonprofit called Women in Non-Traditional Employment Roles. Um, we are a pre-apprenticeship program for women who want to um, join a career in union construction. So we help with um, teaching them life skills, giving them the physical conditioning, um, the fundamentals of construction, and then we certify them, and then we place them in a union job. So um, a lot of like my question is how do we as an organization get in touch with um, who would be the perfect people to get in touch with to um, not only recruit the women but but yeah like help them get into our program because we do uh, work with justice involved women however um, it's kind of hard to get I guess um, outreach to them you know so I just wanted to see how that how we could do that more efficiently. I'm happy to jump in. This is Kelly LoBianca from the Department of Economic Opportunity. Ashley, thank you for your question. If you aren't in touch with our team at the Department of Economic Opportunity already, we'd like to be in touch with you because we do um, support pre-apprenticeship to apprenticeship opportunities specifically in the trade um, in the trades. And so we're, we're well connected there um, and would love to make sure that we're supporting from both an outreach and an education um, uh, element uh, too, like through our American Job Centers of California um, and the outreach of our department and also exploring um, some of the pathways that you offer directly. So um, I will make sure that um, in our follow-up, we have the right um, folks for you to connect to but I, I recommend that you um, connect to our American Job Centers of California if you haven't already, and then we'll make sure you get the right person at the department too. Great, thank you for that. Uh, next question we'll take from Ronnie House, Sharin Singal. Uh, request has been sent for you to unmute. Please go ahead, Ronnie. Good morning. I hope everyone is doing uh, well. Thank you so much for this. Um, I really appreciate it. I want to lift up Commissioner Garcia's uh, comment and ask a question to follow 
it up. I am the executive director of Ronnie's House. We're located in Long Beach and serve the LA County area. And we've been blessed enough to work going on year three with uh, through a program with DMH in LA County called Transforming LA, which has been such an amazing blessing. So thank you DMH for that program because it's really allowed us to mobilize re-entry resources. One of the questions I have is, does the LA County have a clear path for hiring if your justice impacted or are there some policy changes that would need to happen at a supervisor's, um, for the County of Supervisors that they would have to advance? Because I know in Long Beach, that's something that I'm working through now in order to get um, and see if we can get support so that Long Beach City actually hires those that are justice impacted as well as the Port of Long Beach. That's my, my first question. And a quick second question is, I do find that um, some of the probation departments are good with outreach, but I do see still politics existing and I know it'll always exist. But sometimes I find that some of the probation departments lean more on municipalities, which ends up being the same sort of governmental thing rather than working with the organizations that are getting the information out. And so I'm wondering what it is that we could do to build better relationships with probation to be of service for probation more on a regular basis, um, if possible. Thank you so much. I'd like to, to jump in if that's okay. Um, First of all, Ronnie, thank you for your your comment and your questions. Being out of Long Beach, we have a specific area office there at our Long Beach area office. And I know they do some really good work in the community, but I, I'm, I'm very encouraged by the work that we're being done, but there's always space for improvement. And so whatever we can do to kind of increase those lines of not just communication, but those lines of action would be something we would really like to pursue. So. Um, I would encourage yourself to to reach out to the department specifically to the Long Beach area office, and I could connect you with with their oversight, their manager of that office to to see how just in that space alone in your area that you serve, what can we do better to be more effective uh, to, with the community, and then from there possibly find a way to expand those efforts across the board. May I also add to director's comments, commissioner, real quick? Please do. Please okay. do. Okay. So just to chime in on that, that our biggest focus, and I think the the a very effective way to focus on what type of changes the county would need to have would be through our large countywide HR. I know that there are managers assigned specifically to these pipeline and other types of practices to be able to promote and work with individuals that have justice involvement. And so that there are point people within the DHR, the large county DHR that I think would really help you address that at a at a global level. So um, same with I was going to say the same offer would be that if you could share your contact information with the um, the oversight commission, then I can connect you to that individual and continue allow have you both have conversations and, and work on that offline. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for all that you're doing. Of course. Thank you. Okay. To chime in, um, I think my colleagues did a good job on that question. I just wanted to get back to my response to Ashley too, into the the commission who's listening. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with DEO about a specific way to partner, um, probably best uh, for us to direct you by going to DEO DEO at opportunity.lacounty.gov, and we'll make sure that gets um, distributed with the slides as well. Um, but that's probably the fastest way for our executive team to triage you. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, and if folks do have additional questions, you can always email coc notify at coc.lacounty.gov and we'll forward your email that you send along to the panelists today. Um, so we are a little bit light on questions. So if anyone does have a question, please raise your hand 
and we will unmute you. Uh, the next question is going to come from Tracy. Tracy, a request has been sent for you to unmute, if you can acknowledge that request. Okay, you're unmuted. Please go ahead, Tracy. Yes, can you hear me? We do. Yes, my question would be, how can families help their loved ones to stay out of jail? Well, it looks like any anyone could chime in on that one. If you'd like to go down the line, panelists, please go ahead. Um, this is Kelly from the Department of Economic Opportunity. I would say for for us, we focus on connection to work. Um, and that could include building your own business or um, connecting to um, an internship if you're a young adult or a, a more permanent job. Um, so, you know, I, I think for us, it's making sure that folks are connected to um, supportive community partners and, and systems like ours and have opportunities to um, uh, connect to uh, wages um and advancement opportunities for their own personal careers so i mean that that's the angle that we're coming to from this and and so we welcome folks to to connect with us because we know sort of active connection to employment um as you've heard from many of our panelists is a way to both pre prevent and and support um folks from from recidivism overall and just to, to kind of piggyback thank you tracy for for calling in um you know, it, it really does come down to stabilization factors and people in our own families, you know, at times may, may be struggling, whether that's employment, uh, housing, uh, some of the basic needs that, that you need to overcome. And before you could even start advancing through, through your own development and your own journey in life. And so probation does have some resources for the communities and, and the specific place doors that was mentioned earlier that sits in the community is a great place to start. Um, to just you know walk in with yourself or your family member and see you know what what specific services would help them benefit uh, to keep them deterred from that path of incarceration or getting into the justice system. Um, so I, I would encourage you to reach out to uh, whatever local probation offices in your community and, and simply ask. I need resources. I need support. And that and that's on both sides, the juvenile and the adult. So. Um, their resource there, and I think the hardest part for many community members is just knowing where to start, right? And so sometimes walking into those offices or giving them a call, it just gets the ball going. But I appreciate your call again. Yeah, I would just add, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit earlier and just want to echo what my colleagues have said, but, you know, just your involvement, asking, checking in with them can make a big difference. Definitely encourage them to participate in programs if they are enrolled in a credible messenger program. Some of the ones I mentioned, like RICMS, our community health workers want to work with family members in support of the folks that they're serving. They, they work with people to help them kind of identify what their personal goals are and to come up with a plan for reaching those goals. So, you know, I think the more people, you know, someone has checking in with them, encouraging them, motivating them, especially you know, when things get hard, it makes all the difference. And, you know, you know, as, um, as was already said, kind of just helping people with their basic needs, whether it's housing or, you know, needing clothing, food, et cetera, helping folks with those kinds of things will make a huge difference mm -hmm. in helping them be successful. And, and, and to echo a little further, okay, thank you for bringing up the credible messengers. Uh, Tracy, you could, there are two organizations that work in our juvenile halls and camps currently they do fantastic work in the community and, and again their uh, their staff consists of people who've been through the system and help people navigate in the community and that's uh, arc or anti-recidivism coalition and the hda healing dialogues in action so there, there are programs that they're incredible messengers could be a great pathway to kind of help connect somebody to that navigator for your family member Awesome. Thank you for that. And uh, we do have a couple of questions that were sent in, so I'll go ahead and read those off. Uh, one of the questions is, how are all of these departments coordinating and collaborating to ensure that services are streamlined? I'm not sure who wants to take that, but any anyone, feel free to chime in. 
I can start. This is Jennifer. Um, just I think that's one of the things that, as I mentioned with Cal AIM and the changes to Medi-Cal that are coming up, that this has been a massive undertaking to for that coordination. There are multiple meetings between the Sheriff's Department, probation, health services, DMH, Department of Public Health, and other county departments and entities on a regular basis with a coordinated plan to figure out and how to really blend and weave our services together. While we may have separate missions and focuses, at the end of the day, we're here to help people. And so I think through the Cal AIM reentry initiatives, that's how we're going to have the best coordination and a global look for all the county programs as we all fit together. I would just add that I think, um, you know, that is sort of one of the key goals of the creation of the new department, the of J JCOB, Justice Care and Opportunities. Um, you know, really one of the main goals is to help streamline services and make sure that people that are impacted are getting to connected to whatever it is that they need at any point in the system, whether that's at the point of the rest, at, at a point, you know, where um, at the court level or, you know, after they've been in jail. So, you know, we're, you know, the, the department's still young, but that is sort of what we're striving towards is making sure that there's better coordination across all of our departments and that people have access to them wherever they are. Um, I also think that the, one of the department's goals is to create more of a streamlined um, assessment and referral process. So um, that's kind of in the works now and, you know, you know working towards that goal of, of better coordination across departments. And, and if I may, uh, to consider uh, our great county, it, it's probably the size uh, of a country, right? As many people that we serve in our communities, as large as our departments are, and we have done a fantastic job in increasing the communications in between our partner agencies, uh, some specifically adults and juvenile, you know, where everybody's specialty is, but a, a, an integrated communication system would, would be something if the county, uh, if we come together, maybe could develop an outlet and, and kind of uplift would be would be great. And and let me add just being on the, the commission today for having us all. These are these are the bodies in which sometimes that communication just gets started. So this is a great opportunity to connect with one another, uh, although all the panelists uh, here have connected in some way, shape or form. Uh, but I just definitely think uh, we have a large county and we could always find better ways to to kind of develop that system. Very good. Thank you for that. And before we um, go to Sharin for a follow up, we do have one more that was sent in uh, and this could be directed to any of the panelists again. And that is where should more county funds be invested to re reduce recidivism in Los Angeles County? Anyone would like to take that away? Let me start. Um, I think, you know, what what has shown works and is less expensive than incarceration is investing in community based services broadly. And that's kind of, you know, what the goal of measure J and the care first community investment funding is. I think, you know, that that's a good start, but there's always more that's needed to make sure that we have um, a range of services in the community to prevent um, involvement in the justice system in the first place. So making sure there's enough supportive housing, there's enough, you know, employment and job training opportunities, that there's enough, you know, people are able to access mental health and substance use services. Um, you know, that's where in order to prevent, you know, future involvement, more more investments in those types of resources, I think, um, makes all the difference. This is Kelly from the Department of Economic Opportunity. I, I definitely uh, agree with Kate. I think that um, Funding what works and then funding it at the scale of the need of the county um, to the point about us being like a country. Um, that's important because um, w right now we, we know what works, um, but is it getting to everyone who needs it? Maybe not at this point. Um, and then I would say to the previous question about coordination, I think making sure that we're funding that sort of coordination among not just county departments, but the very complex governance structure of LA region um, and including funding our community-based organizations that are doing this work on the ground is really, really important. I think um, figuring out what the experience is for 
of system impacted individuals who are working with us is, is key. Because I think one thing you'll notice is that even through these presentations, um, if you go to doors, you're gonna find a lot of county departments and that's really important. If you're gonna go to American Job Centers of California, you're also gonna find a lot of county departments. I think we're doing um, more and more work every day to, to have a presence with each other so that folks uh, do have more of a one-stop shop experience. But I think overall making sure that everyone who needs the supports gets exactly what they need, that kind of investment um, is very proactive and um, you know, I think uh, it's not just going to be us alone. It's going to be a, a more integrated approach with us with our community based organizations. That's that's important. Thank you. And, and, and if I may, recidivism is something that um, every county, city, state, you know, deals with and tries to tackle how to reduce that. And many layers to that to that answer. Um, you know, just coming from the perspective of probation, it's it's when people you know reach our hands. Um, is really focusing on those cognitive behavior interventions. Um, I believe identifying people's uh, skill deficiencies and really building up those life skills help them as they as they continue their journey to make better decisions um, and, and how they go forward. Uh, but but that's just one aspect, right? You have you really need to focus on also providing those services. And as a, all the county partners sit here, is how do we stabilize our people in the community who need it? Um, how do we get that employment? So again, many folds to reducing recidivism, um, but evidence-based pro uh, practices does show that um, one of the most effective interventions is that relationship. Well, that's a relationship with the probation officer or the clinician or who that may be. Um, that relationship has the biggest impact on recidivism. So having our people within our departments trained, um, feeling confident, and engaging with our clients in, in all levels of, of the county. I think that's what really produces the best work. I want to also just quickly chime in um, that one of the big pieces is also to push for the equity and the importance of these things when it comes to funding at the county level, right? So the initiatives of ARTI, which are the anti-racism, diversity, and inclusion, that there's an ARTI lens for budgeting and to make sure that there is equity in the different programs that are being supported and the accountability that comes with that. And so ARTI is applied across not only programs, but budget. And as we raise our voices, not only in the county, but as other panelists have said, to higher levels, you know, LA County, we have one in four, we have 25% of the state population lives in LA County, identifies in, in LA County, 10 million individuals. So one in four Californians lives here in, in LA County. So it's really important that we make sure that we get equitable amounts of resources from the state when we have a quarter of the population of the entire state here. Good. Thank you for that, panelist. Um, and now we'll go back to Sharin. Sharin, I've um, requested to unmute you. you. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for allowing me to follow up and for the space. One of, um, a quick comment and a question. One of the ways that we utilized our funding was actually to create a central hub called Reentry Keys, which is both a website and app, um, and we also have a printed version that aggregated resources from across LA County, both governmental as well as nonprofit resources so that individuals do have an access point. Um, and that's something that, that um, Ms. Hunt, I'll definitely will send over to you and, and other panelists. Uh, the question I do have is, do we have a toolkit that's created by the county that actually can be distributed to service providers, nonprofits, including, um, you know, I pulled resources from everywhere. I just had my researchers look and search and grab. I'm addicted to resources, I swear. And my staff's always laughing at me. They're like, you and resources. Um, and so I am, in my work, I'm more than happy to lift up this work that you have, the resources, is there a toolkit of some kind that we could utilize and also help you distribute out to other nonprofits to access these resources and help you with outreach? A 
That's a great question uh, and I'm a communications person for the county level. I'm not necessarily sure, but I don't know if each of you have anything at your department level or if requests could be made. We can always um, ask Sharin to send an email in and connect them with your communications team. For the Department of Economic Opportunity on the slides you'll receive um, are some connector points for our American Job Centers of California, our East LA Entrepreneur Center, um, and the host of programs and services that we offer. So I welcome folks to, to start there. Um, although I also welcome folks to, to go to JCOD because I think Kate makes a very good point that this is sort of a, a centralizing department for folks that are um, engaged with the, the, the criminal justice system. Yeah, and um, you know, just to add to that, one of the one of the um, goals that came out of the alternatives to incarceration um, uh, community process a couple of years ago, which resulted kind of was the precursor to JCOD, was to create kind of a toolkit or you know a um, a directory of resources that people can go to um, on the reentry journey. So that is something um, that JCOD is working toward working towards creating. Um, there are, I think, going to be a couple of apps that sort of serve that purpose. So they're not available yet, but um, we can make sure to provide inf information on those on those tools and resources when they do become available. I think for DMH, we're just trying to also make sure that our information is updated in public facing obtainable ways. Um, through the website and different media platforms. And we're making a conscious effort to um, get that information out because our concern is like anything that as soon as you bring out a physical copy back in the day with our books and binders, um, they get outdated. And so we wanna be able to have something in the most um, up-to-date format possible. And um, look, and, and I know of some of the JCOD projects in the pipeline and how we're supporting them in different ways. So I'm excited to see what JCOD will be bringing. Um, there's no pressure on them, right? They already, it, it's already there, but it's, yeah. um, there are some exciting efforts in the process to really try and any contributions from anyone in the community is always welcome. Yeah. And in the meantime, JCOD does have a website. <laughs> That you can go to which lists um, some of our different programs and resources um, so that's a good place to go for now um, and that's jcod.lacounty.gov um, but more resources um, coming soon very good thank you for that uh, maisha has the next question you're unmuted please go ahead thank you i want to thank everyone um, learning so much today i do have a question in particular for probation I am an education rights holder. I volunteer with um, youth and young adults that are just up in um, that also may have experience um, foster care as well. So my question regarding um, those youth that receive accommodations through the IEPs or 504 programs, I mean, meetings, um, how do we, how does probation um, give the warm handoff? I have noticed at times that there were gaps in, um, access to those accommodations so that the youth and the young adults can continue their education. Thank you. Maisha, first of all, I need to apologize because I couldn't hear specifically. Uh, you, you came across a little statically, but what I did pick up a little bit is about the soft uh, handoff into the community. Um, I'll always recognize that our department can do better in, in multiple spaces, but in, in especially the, the warm handoff um, and so our community, we're working closely with DYD and, and trying to really um, uplift and grow our credible messenger programming. Um, and, and we feel like this, this would be a great way to, to get our young people navigated through the community. Um, it is through, it's through that channel. Um, so I, I hope I answered your question. If not, please feel free to reach out again uh, and, and I'll get some more information for you. Yes, very good. And Maisha, you are breaking up a little bit. I don't know if you can speak a little bit louder or move away from background noise. If you have any additional questions, you're unmuted now. Sure. Um, just to just to clarify, can you hear me? A little bit. There's a there's some background noise for sure. But if you can just talk loud, hopefully that will help. 
Okay, so it was regarding the educational accommodations um, that some of the youth and young adults um, receive at the um, while they're in probation at the schools that are overseen by probation when they transition to the community, um, the warm handoff process for that, because I have noticed being an education rights holder for some of the youth and young adults that there was some, some gaps when it came to that, which oftentimes led to the youth or the young adults feeling a bit frustrated and unmotivated to stay the course. Sure. Thank you, Maisha, for, for I, I heard you much clearer this time. Um, if I may not have the, core, the answer to your questions this morning, I can connect you with our educational services senior manager who oversees our educational piece of probation and deals with our um, our, our LACO partners where, while our young people are with us in our care and developing their their path to, to their schooling journey with us, but also that part of handing them off to the community. So um, if there's something that we can do better, suggestions, or if it's just information, I could definitely connect you with that manager who oversees that. Very good, yes. So Maisha, if you can email cocnotify at coc.lacounty.gov, we'll be sure that your email gets over to the probation team for that. Um, and I will, before we go to Trinity Johnson, we do have a question related to health. It's what is the best way to request medical records for a patient who was receiving medical treatment during incarceration? Is this a request that can be made to request medical records from jail or prison? And we don't on this session have anyone from the Department of Health Services. So if you can email your question, Alma, I'll, I'll forward that over. But I'm not sure if anyone else on the, on the panel has any experience with requesting medical records from when people were incarcerated. Okay, uh, so Alma, we'll take your question via email and get that over to the correct department. Uh, next, we'll go with Trinity Johnson. I've sent a request for you to unmute. Please go ahead with your question, Trinity. Hello, thank you. Um, my question was, can the panelists describe the recidivism rates in the state of California, and do you track the rates in your organization? Thank you. I can jump in. No. <laughs> I can quickly jump in. Um, so, as far as the recidivism rate for the state as a whole, I I don't have that information in front of me. Others may. Um, I do believe that um, if you're looking at CDCR's recidivism rate from um, from state prison, it's around forty five percent, and that's their three year recidivism rate. And I, I believe that the um, the rate has remained around that like between like 40 to 50 percent in in the recent years um you know i think it it always depends on kind of how you're defining recidivism and you know which um what population you're looking at whether that's county level state level etc um as far as our programs go we do track recidivism across each of our programs um it's, many of our programs are, are fairly new at this point so um you know yeah. The oldest one, I think, is about three years old. Um, so we haven't yet reached the point at which, you know, we're able to really um, get a strong look at how well we have reduced recidivism. But we do have some information that shows, you know, kind of like after one year, um, you know, folks who participated in our programs um, have had lower rates of recidivism kind of compared to um, baseline populations. We, you know, we will, as we have more information come available, we do want to make that um accessible to the public and you know we do have to recruit or uh, report recidivism recidivism rates to some of our funders so happy to provide more information on that when it is available um but right now many of our programs are still kind of young and so um you know we want to see how things look in the next couple of years and just to, to echo some of that Kate, you're right statewide um you know i had per percentage of like 35 to 40 percent but then again it's it's all the the factors you have to take in place again are you speaking out of county in the mix it throws off the numbers uh tremendously because of our population um, in regards to probation i wish i can give you just one number but we also focus sometimes in our programs and their effectiveness and how they bring down recidivism for a certain population that's being served through that program um, what we need to do better is collectively 
look at those numbers and be able to report out um, in, in a body like this. But we want to say we're making an impact, but we want to bring data to the table to show that and then how we made that impact or how do we reduce the recidivism. Um, and we touched it in this conversation a little earlier. Um, if we continue to do the good work and, and, and revolve some of our efforts around cognitive behavior interventions, then we could start tracking the amount of those interventions we're giving to all of our clients. Um, and so by doing that, you're providing dosage of intervention. And so it would be very interesting, not only for our county partners, but I think for the community is to see if we increase the amount of dosage of interventions, does that bring down recidivism, right? Is there a direct relationship between those two? So in short, to answer your question, I don't have an overall percentage of a recidivism, whether that's gone up or down, it's more focused on programs, but we could definitely do better in that space. Very good. Would anyone else like to chime in? Um, I'll be very quick. I think for our department, um, sort of economic opportunity and mobility are the primary like outcomes of monitoring over time. So we certainly are looking at folks connecting to jobs, their retention and their advancement and wage progression over time and career progression over time. Um, certainly um, where uh, we are running uh, very specific programs around for justice impacted individuals, we're also looking at recidivism that it's part and parcel of whether someone's economic mobility progresses over time. Um, so I just wanted to, to share that here. Very good, thank you. Um, and as a reminder, if you're an attendee and you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We do have someone who commented on Facebook and they say, the current programs and those of the past are not working. Why not include more community organization engagement in these programs? So uh, it doesn't say a specific panelist, but, and I know that a couple of you have already discussed your uh, partnerships with community, but if you'd like to chime in, that'd be great. For us at Economic Opportunity, all of our programs are delivered with uh, partner organizations. So I certainly echo um, that commenter's uh, sentiment. You know, we help organize the strategy and the resources and the evidence-based um, um, opportunities, but we deliver through CBOs, through labor partnerships, through industry associations community colleges and beyond. Um, we know that we want to invest in those closest to the community to deliver our services. Um, I will also say just broadly, I've been um, impressed. I sit on the advisory board for the Care First Community Investment um, uh, Committee and you know, hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of dollars are going directly into the hands of community-based organizations to deliver across the spectrum of health and housing and employment and youth development and beyond. And so, I think there's sort of a collective county um, uh, agreement that this this work has to be done um, at the community level. Yeah, I 100% agree with Kelly. Um, you know, similar to DEO, all of our programs are contracted out to community-based organizations. We don't run anything ourselves. Um, right now, I think we have upwards of 40 CBOs that we're working with across our reentry programs. And that's because we know that the CBOs um, know best how to do this work. You have trust in the communities. And we do want to make sure that we're continuing, you know, we already do we take a lot of feedback from the organizations we're working with. And we want, we want to make sure that our programs are shaped by your feedback and input. So we'll continue to be committed to that and also look for ways to make sure that we're providing opportunities to new community based organizations, maybe that we're not currently um, working with, we always want to expand and um, make others aware of the opportunities that they can apply for. There's, yes, more, we're committed to doing more to kind of just spread the word about um, our services and contracting opportunities. Yeah, our partners in the community are a huge, uh, make a huge impact in our clients' lives. And so I think as a county, and I'll speak for probation ourselves, we just need to do better in explaining the mechanism and how to connect, right? Um, our clients to themselves and the funding for our CBOs out there who could really use that, that financial backing. So we have numerous, and I wish we had a, a one number to just kind of present out, but we do have numerous CBOs that we work with daily 
in, in, in our institutions and in our care centers with our young people or as well in the community with our adult population, with tons of CBOs that, that we engage with, but there's so many more we can. So it's just kind of increasing that mechanism, educating people, how do we do the connection? I wanted to just chime in for DMH that um, we actively have different stakeholder groups that we engage with in different ways. And so we want, we want participation. We want the community to tell us what they need. And so there's underserved community committees. There's our service area, local planning teams. There are um, the MHSA process with the prop 63 programs and dollars. There's many different ways. Um, even just our, our drop in centers in the lobby of our building, our headquarters building, you know, we we really want to make sure that we're addressing the needs of the community. And we know that we're going to do that by listening to the community and having them be part of those programs and part of the creation and the implementation process for them all. So, you know, please be an active stakeholder and member just as you are in meetings like this. This is huge. Thank you. Very good, thank you. And the last question that we have that was sent in uh, before we go to closing is, which services can your department more efficiently offer to reduce recidivism? So I know you've spent a lot of time talking about all of your programs, but if there is one program that you can offer more efficiently, please feel free. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I really feel uh, our department is, is putting a lot of work into bringing some strong programs to our young people that are in our care currently in our juvenile halls and camp settings. And I think just just reaching uh, the people of our community at that young age is, is, is crucial to keep them out of the justice system moving forward and then connecting them to the community, providing the resources to them and their families. Um, I think if that's in the young, as well as always considering stabilizing the other population sets, but just focusing on our young to, 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 to really educate, help develop, provide that support they need um, wherever we touch them when they're currently on probation, off probation, hopefully, whatever we can provide them, I think that would have a really large impact on recidivism. I think for us, um, well, one, I would say like the point of, 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 of re-entry to the right service that you need, like how we can sort of collapse that. And you've heard that all, all across all of my colleagues today and in some of the efforts. Um, one of the things we talk about a lot in my department too is there's a lot of programs and services out there, um, but I think an efficiency that's important is making sure that we're well coordinated and that whoever we're engaging with has um, not just connection to the program or service that's in front of them, but the world of resources that might benefit them, which may be many or one, um, and making that process smoother. So you heard Kate talk a little bit about, you know, the assessment processes or the ways that all of us are coming together to collaborate and align our services. Like that, that part to me, I think is the biggest efficiency that um, when someone actually does engage with the county, which we know can be a hard enough first step, but they get something that's useful to them um, and they feel trust, they trust in us and that we're able to connect them to exactly what they need over time. For us, I would say, and hopefully I'm understanding the question correctly, but just um, one, one area that we could use more of is housing. Um, we, you know, housing is such a, a big, important piece for um, people in reentry, and we have some interim housing, but not nearly enough to serve the needs of, of people we're serving. And as I think has been covered before, many people with justice involvement are also um, at risk of homelessness. And, you know, that's so important, such an important stabilizing factor for people. So I would say, um, you know, being able to provide more interim or longer term housing for people you know, as they get acclimated back into the community would be one area that could be really beneficial for our work. I think for DMH, it's for us to make it easier to understand what's going on in the inner workings. Um, oftentimes, as our, my colleagues on this panel have shared, there's a lot of different things that are going on. 
but we need to do a better job of, <clears throat> excuse me, marketing, but just marketing's one piece of it, but we need to make sure that we have that information accessible. And so that's one of the things that we've been focusing on and trying to get updated is our information that's available to the public in the different electronic platforms so that it's hopefully accessible to more people and um, across many different languages as well. Very good, thank you. And that does conclude all of our questions. So Commissioner Garcia, I'll turn it back to you now. Thank you, Jennifer. And once again, thank you to each of our panelists this morning for sharing your thoughts and to, to the community members for tuning into this important conversation hosted by the Civilian Oversight Commission. <clears throat> we hope you can join us at our upcoming commission meeting at Dollar Hyde Community Center in Compton set for this Thursday, June 15th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and the next community meeting at Florence Library in South Los Angeles on Saturday, June 24th from 10 a.m. until noon. The commission is also taking, taking applications for community appointed volunteer commissioners like me. If you have an interest in this, please reach out to learn more. I'd love to share my experience as a commissioner. Visit our website, coc.lacounty.gov for more information and to RSVP to our events. Again, thank you everyone and have a great day. This concludes our conference. Thank you. Thank you.